as another example of equational specification, let's look at our old friend, the Q. So here's the specification for Qs. And actually, here's the specification for stacks once again. Uh, notice if I flip back and forth between these really quickly, the only thing that's changing uh, is some identifiers here, just the names of the module and the operations. All of the types stay the same. So clearly, we need more to specify a Q than just the names and types of the operations. To do an equational specification for this, we'll start off the same way as we did with stacks. What is is empty of empty? Well, of course, that's true. What's is empty if you apply it to an n queued element? Well, of course, that's going to be false, because now there's at least one element. As a third equation, how do front and in queue go together? This is kind of similar to how did peak and push go together for stacks. Well, it's more complicated to write down this equation for queues than it was for stacks. And that's because it depends on whether the queue was already empty or not. We're going to come back and look at this in more detail in just a second. Let me also point out that the same phenomenon, though, is going to occur with the fourth equation. So for stacks, that told us how um, pop and push interacted. Here it's telling us how dq and nq interact. And it's, again, more complicated because it's going to depend on whether the Q is empty or not. Okay, let's drill down into those third and fourth equations now. Suppose you were going to go get lunch at Louis's lunch. Well, here's what that third equation is telling us about the Q. What if the Q is already empty? So there's no one standing in line at the food truck. Then you can just walk right up to it. You will be at the front of the queue after being in queued, that is. And then you can get whatever you want, maybe some tasty Cajun fries, for example. On the other hand, suppose you arrive at the food truck and there's a bunch of people in the queue in front of you, all socially distanced appropriately, of course. Well, in that case, what's going to happen after an in queue? You're going to be at the back of the line there. You've got to wait for all the other people to get their food. So the front of the queue doesn't change. It's still the same person after that in queue operation. So that's how the third equation works. What about the fourth equation? Well, suppose once more that you arrive at the food truck and the queue is empty. There's no one else there. Then after being in queued, so you get in queued on the queue first, then being de queued, the queue is going to be empty. That's what the first half of this equation is telling us. OK, but what if there's people in the queue already? So it's not empty. OK, then if we in queue you, you're at the back of the line waiting for your food. And then we de queue somebody. Then we get this queue. So that's the result of the left hand side of the equation here. Uh, notice that there's two people in front of you and you're at the end. OK, now let's look at the right hand side of the equation. OK, so I'm resetting here. Uh, we, we we're back to the beginning. There's three people in the queue. Now the first thing is we dequeue somebody. So the first person gets their food. And then you come along and get in queued on the end. So it's the same queue that results either way. Still two people in front of you and you're at the end. So that's what the fourth equation is saying here, how DQ and NQ interact by being swapped around like that. And that's definitely more complicated than we saw for stacks. We can, once more, implement queues very simply as lists, uh, just using mostly list module functions, append, and so forth. And all of these equations that I just showed you do hold simply by evaluation for this implementation as well. There's nothing very deep about that. But we also have our old friend, the to list queue, that we've studied a couple times now. And here we'll come back to it a third time. So remember that with the to list queue, we have two lists that represent the queue. And together, they represent a queue which is the first list followed by the reverse of the second list, so the front and the back list. And we have a rep invariant, which is that if the front list is empty, then the back list has to be empty. So before, I've shown this to you in a couple different implementations uh, with maybe records before. Now I'm using tuples. There's no essential difference. So the empty queue is just empty, empty. To figure out whether a queue is empty, 
Well, all we have to do is look at the front list because of that rep invariant. Doesn't matter what the back is. If the front's empty, the back has to be empty. To in queue an element onto the queue, uh, well, we can check and see if the front is empty. If it is, then we have to leave the back empty, but we can put the, the new element into the front. Otherwise, we can cons that new element onto the back queue because we're guaranteed that the front is not empty, so we're not going to accidentally violate the rep. To figure out what the front element of the whole queue is, we can just take the head of the front. And now, unlike before when we were talking about stacks, this is a piece of code that could legitimately raise an exception. On the other hand, if we go back and look at our equational specification, you'll notice that that specification says nothing about what front does when applied to an empty queue. So we've left that behavior unspecified, and therefore we're not going to have to reason about it when we do, do proofs based on this specification. Next, for DQ, uh, this is the most complicated of the operations, we need to see whether removing one element from the front is going to cause the front to become empty. If so, we reverse the back and install it as the front. Otherwise, we just get to remove that element. Again, our equational specification says nothing about what DQ does to an empty Q. We've left that unspecified, and that's why I'm getting away with raising exceptions here uh, when I try to take the tail of a potentially empty front. Now, the proofs for these are not straightforward. They actually require a considerable amount of work and I've put them all in the textbook for you to read. The interesting thing I want to talk about now with those is the abstraction function and the representation. The rep invariant, you should recall, is a precondition for every operation of a data abstraction, which is to say we get to assume that it holds uh, for any queue that's passed in to say NQ. So in this implementation of NQ, if F is empty, then B must also be. And that's essential to being able to prove that this implementation of NQ is correct. Because if the back weren't empty in the then branch, well, then we'd be losing elements from the queue. Right? There'd be some elements in B. We're throwing those away when we return an empty backlist in the then branch. So it's essential that that rep invariant holds. The other place that's really interesting in those proofs is the abstraction function. We eventually reach a place in those proofs where we need to show that two queues are equal, but actually they aren't the same two lists. So we end up needing to show that the reverse of F, the front list, followed by a back list that's just the singleton element X, is equal to the reverse of X cons F, followed by an empty back list. Now, of course, as OCaml pairs and as lists, those are not the same expressions. They do not evaluate to the same code, but they represent the same queue. Both of them represent elements in the same order, which is to say the queue that has all the elements of F in reverse order followed by X at the end. That's what both the left and the right hand side there so we end up introducing a new notion of equality. Well, not a new one, augmenting our existing notion of equality to say that if the abstraction function applied to two expressions is equal, then the two expressions, we can treat them as equal in our equational proofs. But that lets us establish that these two cues really do represent the same thing and thereby prove the correctness of the implementation of two list queues according to our queue specification.